voice from heaven proclaimed, Go to all nations. Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. To Abraham, God said, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And the church said, Amen. In Genesis chapter 22, he further explains his promise. In Genesis 22, 18. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. God called Abraham to be a great nation. And yet the promise was that his seed, his offspring, would bless all the nations. The mystery of this was simple. From his seed came the Hebrew people. The people of Israel and Jesus himself. And it was from this one nation that Jesus came and blessed all the nations. A voice from heaven proclaimed, go to all nations. Amen. Amen. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. In one of the darkest hours of Israel... In verse 2, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills and all nations will stream to it. This was promised to the people of Israel at their darkest hour. And we believe fulfilled in Acts 2 verse 5, when on the day of Pentecost, the apostles preached the gospel, the full gospel of Jesus Christ has said on that day that represented was every nation under heaven. God has always intended the gospel to go to all nations in one generation. Turn to Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel 2, Daniel gives back to Nebuchadnezzar the dream that Nebuchadnezzar would not share with anyone so he could know who really knew the prophecy. And it reads in verse 31 of Daniel 2, You looked, O king, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. See, they used awesome back then too, Amen. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on the feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold were broken to pieces at the same time and became like chaff on the threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock struck the statue, became a huge mountain, and filled the whole earth. The prophecy through Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel was clear. At the time of the Roman Empire, there would come a rock that was taken out, not by human hands, and if it wasn't done by humans, it was done by God. And that rock would destroy all other kingdoms. And the Bible says that rock then became a mountain that filled the whole earth. The prophecy was the gospel would go to the whole earth. Are you with me, church? And then in Matthew 5, a voice on earth proclaimed to go to all nations. Matthew 5, verse 14. You are the light 
of the world. That's what that voice said. It didn't say you are the lie of the world that you could possibly get to. It says you are the light of the world. Did they understand it? Absolutely not. Was it Jesus' conviction? Absolutely. That the true disciples of God are the light and the only light of the entire world. And the church said, yeah. Go to Matthew chapter 24. A voice on earth proclaimed to go to all nations. In verse 9. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. That's what Jesus said. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. This is not the end of time. It is not the second coming. Jesus makes it clear from an earlier reference this had to do with buildings. This had to do with the temple. This had to do with the temple being destroyed in 70 A.D. And Jesus says, before the end, before the temple is destroyed and what was called Judaism is annihilated, you're going to be hated by all nations. And then in verse 10, and the time will come when many will turn away from the faith. They used to be disciples. And they will betray and hate each other. That scripture is true in our, our listening today. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. We, we, we haven't even begun to say that there could be false prophets in God's church. And because of the increase of wickedness inside the church, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all generations. And then the temple will be destroyed. Don't anybody ever, ever listen to someone that says that the gospel was not taken around the world in the lifetime of the apostles. In their generation. A voice on earth proclaimed to go to all nations. Matthew 28. Verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, and some doubted. This is after the resurrection. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. For years we were criticized over this passage because we said that this passage taught that you should baptize disciples. And I do believe that by inference it does say that. We are to baptize disciples. Amen, church? The actual wording of that is found in John chapter 4, verse 1, that Jesus didn't baptize, but his disciples baptized disciples. But the actual Greek here says, to the eleven faithful guys, this is the explicit command of the moment, to this ragged band of brothers. You go to all nations and baptize them. In the Greek, that then refers back to the nations. That was commanded to them. Not just to those that they would teach all the commandments to. Who likewise have the great commission to go to all nations. 
in Acts chapter 13, a voice on earth proclaimed to go to all nations. Verse 47. This is in the middle of one of Paul's sermons. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. That phrase is actually taken from the book of Isaiah, chapter 49, verse 6. But the phrase is also used by Jesus in Acts 1, verse 8, when he charges the apostles right before he's taken up into heaven. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, and then to the ends of of the world. That was their command. And that is his command to this day. And then in Revelations chapter 14. John in his vision says in verse 14 of chapter 14. I looked and there before me was a white cloud. And seated on the cloud was one like a son of man with a crown of gold on his head. That means that he was martyred. And a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. A voice from heaven proclaims, Gone to all nations. That was the message of God to the church in 96 A.D. The scripture that's inspired us all, Psalm 126. When the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter and our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said amongst the nations, the Lord's done great things for them. The Lord's done great things for all of us. Amen, church. And we are filled with joy. At our first World Missions Conference in 82, the theme was From Jerusalem to Rome. That was the theme. We began to believe that God wanted us to go to all nations. What was the times like? Let me remind you. Well, for some, I just have to tell you about it. But for others, I will remind. The 1970s and early 80s, the mainline churches of Christ, of which we were a part in the campus ministry movement, was not growing, but shrinking. It was dying. The average congregation had but seven baptisms of year, Six of them were children of the members. Only one outsider baptized a year. Less than nine, more than 90% of those baptized out of the world fell away. The six that were baptized from the membership, over half of their children fell away. Right, Doug? Arthur? You? The churches of Christ had multitudinous congregations in every city, though not spread around the world. They were concentrated mainly in the United States and a few in Great Britain. There were churches of Christ that were what we would call the black churches of Christ. There were the Latin churches of Christ. There was the one cuppers. See, they believed by looking at the scriptures that Since Jesus only passed one cup around, then, you know, to be scriptural, then you should only have one cup. 
Now, a lot of people changed that thinking when tuberculosis hit. <laughs> then we're the Church of Christ with no Sunday school. There's other Church of Christ that said, we refuse to have a kitchen. Where is it in the Bible? The churches of Christ, in fact, were split themselves in 1906 between the Christian churches and the churches of Christ. What was the only difference between the conservative Christian churches and the churches of Christ? The church of Christ believed that it was a sin to have instrumental music. That was the only difference between those two groups. There were little campus ministry groups in different parts of America that were, that were genuinely trying to preach the word and make disciples. And yet it was an uncoordinated effort. Even our effort in Boston was one that at first glance would appear insignificant. The Boston church, then called Lexington, had but two baptisms the previous three years. And then we met in the Gimple's living room. A pretty raggedy band of brothers. One church, one nation, 30 would-be disciples. Over the next six years, in some ways, still insignificant, the church had an attendance of about 1,000. And there were now churches... In three nations, and there were five churches, Boston, Chicago, London, New York, Toronto. What was so amazing about it? Up until that time, in campus ministry and other situations, we always sent our young men into existing congregations. And yet some of us that got sent into these existing mainline congregations found that all heck broke loose when we started to preach the word. And the scriptures rang true to us. Do not pour new wine in old wineskins. You will ruin both the wineskin and the wine. You'll ruin that congregation and you'll ruin that young preacher. And so the radicalness of Boston was to start planting churches and building bases of only sold out disciples. By 85, we had the attention of the mainline church. And particularly the other groups that were trying to do it. And so what started to happen is people started moving to Boston or our church plantings. Because they were fired up about going to all nations. From this came what we call the reconstructions. And so a little group of disciples inside a little church in Berkeley, we called out to be just disciples and said, we're going to just have, we're just going to go after all of San Francisco. And we say, okay, it's not that many. And yeah, a lot of people didn't follow. But we said, we can win San Francisco to Christ. Well, how many disciples were there? It doesn't make any difference. If you've got just a few, that's enough to get the job done. On the other hand, when the board at the Atlanta, or at that time, I forget the name of the church in Atlanta, said, we do not want the Boston movement coming here. And the board took a stand against the evangelist. There were some that said, listen, don't go. It's too bloody. And I said, we got to go. Atlanta needs to be saved. And we started a new congregation. We were hated for it. And yet countless hundreds of souls were won to Christ. By 1994, there were 146 churches, 53 nations. And we penned the evangelization proclamation. The goal was simply this, to plant a church of just disciples. That's what was radical about God's movement of just disciples in every nation that had a city with at least a 100,000 population. Now, from 79 to 94, 
We got the 53 nations. When we counted on up, we said we'll do this by the year 2000. We had to go to 111 more nations to get the job done. But by working together, by coming together, by pooling our resources, by pooling our people, by cooperation, by the year 2000, we would gotten the job done. Four hundred churches, 171 nations. It was clear to everybody, this was not a movement of man, it was the movement of God. Who were we to think, with this historic assault on the very gates of Satan, that there wouldn't be the most vicious backlash in the history of Christendom? We no sooner celebrated the 2000 Jubilee in November in L.A. than one of my children began to struggle in the faith. And what that did is it caused people to have doubts. And I understand that. And with those doubts came a loss of confidence. The unresolved relationships had been there for years, but had been not really covered up but have been focused on pleasing God and the mission began to emerge. There was resentment and bitterness. Some thought we'd been too aggressive in our six-year plan. Grumbling began to boil to the surface. At the L.A. Unity meeting, how ironic, leaders got up and literally shouted at each other disrespectful remarks that they had held in for years. This happened at that meeting with the GSLs, and then it happened when a lot of those guys went on back. Each level of leadership totally blown away that anybody underneath them wasn't 100% loyal and loving their style of leadership. With the eradication of of spiritual leadership, let us say, came the Crete letter. When the Crete letter hit, there was no one to speak. No one felt they could speak. And the people believed so many lies. Now, granted, it was laced with many truths. But that's what makes it so powerful. With the separation of leaders came the separation of churches. With the separation of churches came the separations of factions in the church. Grumbling, rebellion, and complaining ran wide. Churches like D.C. said, well, we're going to split into four different parts, now five, so that we can evangelize better. And yet, if you will look closely at that situation... You will find that, as always, in all religious movement that's begin to falter, it was personality conflicts that were unresolved. How do we understand these events? Turn to Nehemiah chapter 1. Word comes back to Nehemiah that the walls of Jerusalem are broken down. Its gates have been burned with fire. And Nehemiah prays to the Lord, and we, we're going to jump in right in the middle of the prayer in chapter 1, verse 8. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you amongst the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the furthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. I believe with all of my heart, those days in the 80s and 90s, we truly were the movement of God. That's not to say there weren't saved people outside of the movement. 
Movement means there's geographical and numerical expansion. If things are not expanding, then they're not moving. And if they're not expanding numerically, if they're not expanding geographically, then there is no longer a movement. The Bible teaches right here that what happened in the 80s was people who were like-minded, that were sold out to God and His mission, they came together. But it wasn't us coming together. It was God bringing us together. It was His movement from the start. And when things broke down in the early 2000s, He scattered us because of our sin. Go look at that prayer of Nehemiah. And he starts on out. He says, Father, forgive me of my sins and the sins of my forefathers and the sins of everybody. The lie that the people were given is it was just the leader's sins. Now, let me tell you something. I know a lot of the leaders. And I'm one of them. And we had a lot of sins. But in reaction to our sin came the sins of the people. As blind as the leaders were to their sins, so Satan sent a strong delusion. And not only blinded the leaders, but blinded the people. And the people started saying, hold it, I want to be under righteous leadership. When they were totally unrighteous in their rebellion, their bitterness, their gossip, and their slander. What was needed? The same thing that's needed right now. Because it's not fixed. It's not right. It's not of God. People ask me, well, bro, how how are you doing? I'm doing really awesome. Say, well, wasn't that just horrific what you went through? The criticism, the hate. The harshness, the rebellion from people you thought were two friends. I mean, people that were Absaloms. And you know something? It took me a while to figure it out. But under a sovereign God, you must believe this. Everything that happens, either God directly makes happen or he allows to happen. And everything that happened to me, God either made happen or allowed to happen for a purpose. He wanted me sold out to God. Exposed were sins such as harshness. When you have people harsh against you, let me tell you something. You're going, we need a lot more mercy around here. I learned that I had a, everything I thought, I thought was always right. And then when I didn't get a word in and everybody else that was telling me thought they were always right, I'm going, hold it. Can't we all get along and work together? I exasperated people with too high of calls. Not of commitment, but of expectation. Particularly in using numeric motivation too much. Now, I think numeric motivation is not a sin. But using it too much brings incredible exasperation. And you know, when people are going, you need to repent more. You need to change more. You don't get it. I'm going, man. Can't we just kind of lighten up a little bit right here? I mean, don't we believe in grace? I believe my greatest sin was allowing people to glorify me and take the glory from God. It wasn't my thinking. 
but I became deluded. And when I saw people trying to power over me, I'm going, oh my God, don't you see your quest for power? See, I had to have all that happen that hard because that's what it took to get my attention. The things that have happened these past few years have been so hard because that's what it's taken to get our attention as a movement. My concern is that, yes, things are somewhat coming back together. But a few years ago, I was playing basketball. Or, Or maybe as Corey and Doug would say, attempting to play basketball. And I wasn't watching, and Eric threw me this pass, and it hit my little finger. Baby, it it really hurt. And I looked down, and my whole nail was just bleeding. I'm going, that's going to leave a mark. And you know something? It kind of works today, but it's a little bent. See, things can come back together, but that doesn't mean that they're going to heal right. And I want to bring a conviction upon us tonight that things need to heal right. How do things need to heal right? Number one, it's not a matter of being in an evil system. My Bible teaches me in Mark chapter 7. That's not the things that are outside of a man that make him unclean. But it's the things that come out of the heart that make him unclean. What made our movement unrighteous? It was our hearts, our arrogance. It was not an evil system. Secondly, to bring clarity... Many of the top leaders, publicly and privately, denounced our call to go to all nations in one generation. There were papers. There were articles. There were lessons. And the brothers that believed in evangelism were quiet. They were cowardly. And they stood and they watched the annihilation of the glue of the movement. I believe with all of my heart, it is not a suggestion. It's not just a good thing to do. It is the very command of God for every generation. It's what made it special in Boston. Number one, you had to sell out to God. Number two, we expected every single Christian to be totally committed to evangelism. And and number three, they simply had to have a heart that whatever the Bible said, that's what we were going to do. Even if we weren't doing it before, that's what we were going to do. And it was awesome those early days of Boston because we got all fired up when we find a new scripture. Oh, wow, we get to restore this. And we were fired up. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul writes this to the Corinthian church. I say this to you in verse 1. I hope you'll put up with a little of my foolishness. But you're already doing that, and I know the church is going to say amen. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband to Christ so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you received a different spirit from the one you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. But I don't think I'm at least inferior to those super apostles. 
What came along was the explosion of, quote, different ideas. A better way. An Absalomic attempt to change the good that had been done. Now, I'm not saying we didn't have a lot to change. But in the early days of the movement, we changed a lot. And we were excited about those changes. I mean, when Doug preached that message about helping the poor, I mean, the, the church there at the World Mission Seminar was so fired up to repent and start doing it. Right here, today we have people preaching a different Jesus. And we're going to talk about that in a second. They're preaching a different gospel. And the Bible says, you put up with it easily enough. That's why we got lukewarm churches. People just put up with it easily enough. Look at verse 13. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. Let me tell you something. You can tell if a preacher or an elder is preaching Jesus or not. All you have to do is just look at that church. And the man that says he's preaching Jesus and has a lukewarm church is totally deluded and used by Satan. We need to understand and get this down as a deep conviction. Jesus came in the world to save sinners. Amen? Amen. Number one, to die on the cross. To bring grace and truth to the world. But number two, if all he had to do was just die on the cross, he could have come to earth, died, gone to heaven, job done. But see, God also wanted a plan to save the entire world. That's why Jesus had to live his life, and that's why Jesus had to make disciples. And I want to do just a quick review of the ministry of Jesus. Go to Matthew chapter 4. I've never seen this before. Jesus was baptized at the end of chapter 3. The first part of chapter 4 is the temptations of Jesus. And then in verse 12 it says... When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he returned to Galilee. John was put in prison while Jesus was in the desert. Isn't that interesting? Here is the man that was trying to get a movement going in Israel. He was sent by God. And Jesus was now, he was fired up because he'd overcome Satan in the desert. And the first thing he hears is that John is in prison. I never knew that. Jesus didn't get to see John the entire time of his ministry. You talk about a dark moment. Now then the Bible says, leaving Nazareth. So he returns to Galilee and it says, leaving Nazareth, he went, and so on. Now interestingly, most scholars believe that the first of the Synoptic Gospels was Mark. Why? It was the smallest. <laughs> then there was Matthew... And then Luke comes along and takes these things and says, hey, there's a few extra things we've got to add right here. In between verses 12 and 13 is Luke chapter 4. Let's go there. Because Luke 4 is Jesus going to his home synagogue in Nazareth. He goes to the home synagogue. He gets the scrolls of the scriptures and he reads... To the home synagogue, verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Or as Steve Johnson would have written, these chains need breaking. We got to rattle those cages, those prisons, is what the Spirit said. And we got to start breaking those chains. 
He goes on and he explains the scripture and he says, listen, my vision is a united world of Jews and Gentiles. Now, at first they were amazed and they were fired up at the scripture. But then when he explained it, they got so furious The Bible says they took him to the edge of a cliff to throw him off and kill him. Now, a lot of people think that Jesus got radical and revolutionary at the end of his ministry. From day one, Jesus was radical and revolutionary and risked his life. That's what my Bible teaches. Now go back to Matthew chapter 4. After he leaves... Nazareth, he lives in Capernaum. Why? To fulfill the scripture. Verse 15. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali. The way to the sea along the Jordan. Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. That was the announcement of the ministry of Jesus. In that darkness of Israel, Jesus reads and fulfills the scripture that a great light has dawned. The next thing we read is in verse 18. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus says, and I'll make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and they followed him. Let me tell you something. People were excited to follow this radical, revolutionary Jesus. And right here we see the power and the secret of the ministry of Jesus. He called every single person that followed him to be just like him. Well, what did he be in just like in Nazareth? He was a radical revolutionary. Willing to give up his life. And he says, I want you to follow me. And not only do I want you to follow me, I want you to get other people to follow me. Now that's intense. And we find in the scriptures that he goes on and he preaches for about six months to a year. Then in Luke chapter 6, we find this. In verse 12. One of those days. Now, have you ever had one of those days? One of those days. Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them whom he designated apostles. Mark chapter 3, verse 13 is the same account, but a little different slant. Verse 13, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called him those he wanted. And they came to him. He appointed 12, designating them apostles that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. Jesus preached for six months or a year. And he made many, many, many disciples. He called all of these guys to be totally sold out to the point of death. Do anything. Give up everything. Just be willing to lay down their lives. Amen? Amen. Then, one night, the Holy Spirit says, you go to the mountain and pray. Because you've got to focus on a few. If you're going to complete a plan that can go to all nations. He prays all night. Now, if you pray all night, that's a big decision. He prays all night. The next morning, he calls all of his disciples to him. And out of that huge group, he calls 12 guys forward. Now, I'm sure they were pretty pumped. Amen. And he says, I'm going to call you guys the messengers. That's what apostle literally means. You're the messengers. Now, at that time, they were looking forward to getting jackets, you know, messenger over the back and everything. There were just 12 guys, the selection of a few. Was it favoritism? No. Was it structure? Yes. Oh, my goodness. Jesus had structure. He says, I want you guys to be with me. Because, you see, discipleship is not an information transfer. It is a heart and a life transfer. You cannot change somebody's life unless you walk with them. With the scattering of churches, with the scattering of people in the church, with the dying of commitment and the scattering of even relationships, there is no discipling going on. You know the story. In Luke 10, he chooses 72 more. 
And then in Matthew chapter 28, after his resurrection, he says, go and make disciples. Just like I've been doing with you guys for three years. Of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And you teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. What was the last thing he commanded them? Go and make disciples of all nations. He didn't just suggest the scriptures. He didn't just teach the scriptures. Jesus expected obedience to the scriptures. And called his disciples to expect the same. We are not to expect obedience to us. We are to expect obedience to the scriptures. Are you with me here, church? What happened in Acts chapter 2? The very first day in verse 41. Those who accept this message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Verse 47. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. By Acts 4.4 it says, And the number of men grew to 5,000. Christianity is for men. Amen, church? And women. Amen. By Acts 16 and verse 5, it says, So the churches were strengthened in faith and grew daily in number. Every single church was having daily baptisms. And in Acts 17 at Thessalonica, we read in verse 6, after Paul just preached three weeks, but when they didn't find them, they dragged Jason and some of the other brothers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. Revised Standard Version, These are the men that have turned the world upside down for Jesus. That was not a compliment, but they took it that way. Colossians 1.6 says, The word of God was being preached all over the world. Perhaps the most interesting scripture about discipleship may be Acts 4. Twelve and thirteen. Peter's preaching to those who had put him under arrest and in prison. And he says, Salvation's found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John. And realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. They were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. The ministry of Jesus was to walk with somebody. To transfer his heart. To transfer his life. So that they would be just like him. Now we're not Jesus. And we're not called to transfer our quirky personality traits are our really neat intuitional things about the Bible. But we are commanded to transfer the heart and life of Jesus to those we walk with. Are you with me right here? And when that happens, an incredible miracle occurs. The Bible says they were unschooled, ordinary men. But we know They did extraordinary things. You see, the miracle of Jesus is to take the ordinary to become the extraordinary. And the good news is, you don't even need a degree. Three short charges. Number one. Ordinary men receive extraordinary upward calls. Remember Timothy? Paul finds him in Acts 16. He says, listen, I want you to come with me. I want to disciple you. I want you to preach the word. He says, amen. Paul says, only one little thing we got to take care of before we go on our journey. You got to be circumcised. No hesitation. He's circumcised. And he's ready to preach. Now turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul writes the church at Corinth. And he shares with them 
kind of how things were, were going with him. Verse 12. We were carved with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. Up to this moment, we have become the scum of the earth, the refuse of the world. And all the preachers in the house said, Amen. 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 So it happened to Paul. Look at this. He's writing the church that he planted. I'm not writing this to shame you, but to warn you, my dear children. Even though you have 10,000 guardians in Christ. Some scholars think that's how big the church at Corinth was. You have 10,000 guardians. 10,000 brothers keepers. You do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. See, Paul wanted to straighten things out. He says, okay, I'm your father in the faith. I want you to imitate me. Now, look what he says. For this reason, I'm sending to you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who's faithful in the Lord. He'll remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. He says, you can imitate Christ in me by me sending Timothy. Number one, Timothy did not go to Corinth because he saw an advertisement on the Internet. Hey, we need an evangelist. When he got to Corinth, he did not go through an interview. He was not asked for a resume. How far we have gotten from the scriptures. Paul called for unity in the churches. He says, this is what I teach everywhere in every church. That doesn't sound like autonomy to me. How was the unity kept? By the leaders being together in the mission. In the mission. Certainly extraordinary things were done. All of us are ordinary, but God intends us all to do the extraordinary. Question one Are you sold out to God? Are you willing to do anything, go anywhere, give up everything? You said that at baptism. Don't back off. If you're not there, tonight is the time to repent. And when you repent, you're going to tell other people that you repented. You say, well, I go to my home congregation and I tell them that I was in Portland, and then I was called just to be totally sold out. I mean, bro, you don't even know what awaits me. Oh, you'd be surprised. I, I have a good hunch what awaits you. I call upon everybody that's not sold out to rededicate your life tonight to Jesus Christ. <laughs> Secondly, I call everybody to a decision tonight to rededicate yourself to discipling. I've asked several people, say, well, how's the discipling coming? He says, well, I think we have discipling. I said, well, who's discipling you? Well, I don't know. Now, let's see. If we would have asked Peter, hey, Peter, do you know who's discipling you? Maybe Timothy. Timothy, do you have any idea who's discipling you these days? I mean, you know, he discipled you when you were, you, you were 18 and everything, when you first started out, and we had that little thing we had to get right with you. But is he still discipling you at 35? What? He's writing you from prison? That sounds like a lot of control. You're telling me the dude is in prison, and he's telling you what to do? And he's 35? Get out of here. Don't you think you need to just simply have just a friendship? I mean, you're mature. What do you need people in your life for? I do believe that when we start out, we need to have a teacher-student relationship. We desperately need that or we will fall away. I think as we mature, things do go to more of an adult-adult relationship. But don't kid yourself. You still need discipling because your time of life is still unique to you. Whether you're a new Christian 
like Lauren Bertolot, she needs some discipling. She's never been 13 years old and a new Christian. With me right here? Victor, well, he's had 10 kids for a while, but he's never been 46 and had 10 kids. And six of them baptized. Pretty good, huh, guys? And myself, hey, I'm around 50. And I've never been in an empty nest situation. I need advice. I need discipling. Everybody has never been where they're at before. And we need other people in our lives because we can't be objective about ourselves. I want to call you to a decision. If you're in a church that's abandoned discipling and you've rededicated yourself to Jesus, you've rededicated yourself to discipling, then you need to find a church that loves the Lord and that's out to save all nations by discipling. Are you saying that that's a lukewarm church? Absolutely. Well, how do I know if I'm in a lukewarm church? Well, that's the challenge. That's what Jesus said. A lukewarm church thinks they're doing really great. I've acquired will. I do not need a thing. And yet you don't realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Now, Jesus says, I wish you were hot or you were cold. Well, let's figure this out a little bit. If you're not hot or cold, then you've got to be lukewarm. So, okay, what is cold? Well, that means you don't even go to church. Well, okay, you're not there. Amen. If you're hot, that means you're on fire. There are baptisms. People are being restored. I mean, lives are being changed. I mean, there's repentance going on every day. I mean, disciples are fired up in the Lord. They're studying their Bible. They're sharing new insights. They're having incredible prayers. Don't you agree that is hot? Now, is your church hot or cold? If it's not one or the other, you're in a lukewarm one. And if they're not practicing discipling, you need to get out of there. You need to get out of there. You know, some people think that that's divisive. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. In verse 18. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. You go back as a fired up disciple into a lukewarm church, there's going to be division and you better be ready for it. Say, how do you know that? Because that's what happened in the 70s. We were fired up for the Lord. We go into lukewarm churches and all heck would break loose. Because the people didn't want to hear the message. You have a choice, as in the Matrix. The red pill or the blue pill. Number two. Ordinary friends become extraordinary side-by-side partners. I mean, I can't tell you how awesome it is to have worked with Elena in the ministry for 28 years. It is awesome. And I'll tell you something. You know, we're, we're normal people. We have... well. Rob Skinner, when he preached about marriage, says you don't have marriage bumps. You have marriage fights. We have marriage fights. I mean, after all, she is Latin. But, you know, the reason I believe that our marriage is awesome is because we love the Lord. We're both sold out. We want each other to be sold out. We love the Lord more than each other. And our performance in our marriage is not based on how each other is doing. We want to please God. And we're both about the mission. I think the second thing that comes is extraordinary relationship between brothers. When you're out about the mission, there's a bond. I mean, I was sharing about Wallace and about Ron. I mean, when they were... When they were studying the Bible with guys like Charles and and guys like Robert, I mean, there was a bond that came with these older brothers. And when I got in there with them to to kind of help us out at the end, I mean, there's a bond. I mean, I mean, it's incredible. I mean, I was feeling super close to a 76 year old guy. That's awesome. That's what the church is all about. 
is that we glory in our differences and they're minimized because we're all about the same mission. Are you with me here, church? See, we need to have a conviction. There was a time in Jesus' ministry, there were no miracles. This when he was in his hometown. You remember that? It says in Mark chapter 6 that he was amazed at their lack of faith. And he could do no miracles there. See, we need to have a deep conviction. Where there is no faith, there are no miracles. And therefore, where there are no miracles, we can be sure there is no faith. And we're talking baptisms. Where there is no faith, there are no baptisms. And where there are no baptisms, you can be sure there is no faith. What we need is faith. And that comes from the Word of God. What are your kingdom dreams? What, what is your passion? Has it been shattered? Has it been destroyed? If you get sold out to Jesus Christ, the good news is you can dream again. That's, that's what Victor Gonzalez says. I mean, he is dreaming. He's spiritually salivating about a Latin ministry of hundreds in Portland. Is that fire you on up? I mean, Russ Preston, when he came here, I mean, he was just so excited to start the CR ministry. And now he's dreaming about CR ministries everywhere. And yet in the church where he was from, they did away with the CR ministry because it was just flat, too hard of discipling. Let me tell you something. Disciples in Portland, we love the CR ministry. And we love the changes in people's lives. What are your kingdom dreams? You want to be a Bible talk leader? Have faith. You want to be an evangelist? Have faith. You want to get married? Have faith. You want to plant a church? Have faith. Whatever your kingdom dream is, have faith. Third charge. Ordinarily down in disastrous times become extraordinary opportunities for God. Dawn is upside or down. Dawn almost is DPI. Dawn is the unity that we bragged about between all the churches. That we could go to any church in the world... And we would walk in and we would just feel like we're in the same place. But God forbid we'd have too much control. Gone, I believe, is the ICOC. I mean, it was a name we invented in 1994 anyway. Many churches have renounced the name International Church of Christ, just going back to Church of Christ, because they, they want to be identified with the churches of Christ. I mean, good gravy, there are only a hundred of them. That sure gives you distinction. But God forbid you'd be identified with others that are radical, revolutionary, dreamers, to take the gospel to all nations in one generation. Some people have come here enthused about what they would find and learn. Many have not come here because they were afraid that Kip would call for a new movement. First of all, before God, it was never my movement, it was God's movement. And mark my word, it was the movement of God. In the 80s, he gathered us. Because we love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we love the mission. And we believe the Bible was the word of God. And we wanted to take the gospel to all nations. We didn't unite ourselves. I, I mean, prayer helps. I mean, Jesus says to pray for the unity of all disciples. Amen. So that makes a difference. But even in prayer, you're trying to move God to do it. See, we don't understand movement very well. Movement is of God. The 80s was not of Boston. It was not of an individual. 
It was of God. God gathered us. In the early 2000s, God scattered us because of all of our sins. I put before you the example of the Portland church, not because it's perfect, but because it's a model church. Why did things go different here? Why are people sold out? You know, people going, oh, wow, the fellowship's so awesome. It's so great, the singing, the fellowship. This is so incredible. I said, this is how it is every Sunday. Get out of here. We have been scattered. What did we do? We had our evening of atonement. What was the evening of atonement? The leaders repented and the people repented. There was no finger pointing because we were all in sin. And we were just grateful to God that he would forgive us. And since God forgave us, we're going, hey man, I forgive you too, bro. And God can build on that. Amen. See, I believe the radical thinking of the hour is simply in Nehemiah 1. God gathers. And then he scatters. But God says, and Nehemiah had to remind God, remember God, you said that if we repent, that you would gather us from the furthest horizon. That is the promise of God. And we claim it tonight. Many people have lost confidence in leadership. Listen. I'm more confident in the repentant leaders than I've ever been. See, now we're repentant. We've made all of our stupid mistakes and sinful mistakes. We're better leaders. I mean, honestly, isn't that what Christianity is all about? You do something wrong, you repent, and then you change, and you're better. I believe right now the guys that are still preaching the word are better leaders than they've ever been. They're not perfect. They shouldn't be idolized, but they sure got to be honored. Amen. The Portland Church leadership has made these decisions. Number one, we are sending the church to Bend, Oregon in the year 2005. Why? Because Jay and Jeff Hernandez grew up there in Bend. You say, well, they must, have, they must have been awesome guys if they're both deacons in the church. No, they grew up in a trailer. They're what you and I would derogatorily call white trash. They are half Latin. So that part's okay. But see, God took ordinary men through the miracle of baptism changed them and through discipling rose them up to be men of character. And Jay's dreams were shattered and yet the dream came back when he got to a fellowship of totally sold out disciples. And he says, I cannot stay in Portland. My wife was one of the originals. Her cost? She's black. And she knows, she goes back, you know, I don't know if you noticed this, but Oregon's basically white. I mean, Bend is central Oregon. That's white, white. And she's black. And, you know, if you have a a, a Latin man and and a black woman, then the kids are perceived to be black. Her cost wasn't herself. Her cost was her kids to go back with black kids in a white, white community. But, you know, after wrestling, she says, you know something, I got baptized. I didn't get baptized for myself. I got baptized to make a difference. She told Jay, let's go. Number two. The Portland Church is going to fund a radical new web portal entitled UpCyberDown21. Meaning, we are going to use the internet that has been used against us. To help turn the world upside down in the 21st century. Amen. Amen. Number three. The leaders in the church, and I'm very grateful for this. Have said, brother, whatever you set your heart upon, wherever you want to preach, we will pay your salary. 
We don't want you to be a burden down in Eugene or in Bend or in other places that the Holy Spirit may send you. We are going to take care of you. And therefore, you'll wear the title Missions Evangelist. I'm fired up about their support. I thank you very much. <clears throat> Number four. The brothers in Portland have decided to target five major cities, some foreign, some domestic, that presently have former ICOC churches in them, where they have abandoned discipling and they have abandoned the call to go to all nations. The names of these cities are under consideration at this time. You say, oh, no. But didn't you teach yourself one church, one city? Oh, I did. And I still believe it. That's the Bible example. But remember, we're not in 1999. Check it. 2004. In 2004, we've got a bunch of factions. We've got a bunch of false teachers. We've got a lot of people preaching a different Jesus. We've got a lot of lukewarm churches. We've got a lot of churches that have imploded. And cotton picking, I'm 50 years old. A couple of weeks ago, I talked to a young man who was very dear to me. And he was breaking up with his girlfriend. I said, why? Dad, she's been in a lukewarm church. And she's losing her faith. I refuse to let that happen anymore. People are saying, brother, be patient. Wait for everybody to get on board. Let, let everybody heal up. See, we, we got to get a conviction. We're mortal. We're going to die. I figure I'm good for one more run. I mean, I figured it on out. And I said, well, let's just pretend there are 500 people that really want to do it. All you 500 in the auditorium. Are, are, you, are you good to go? Let's take it to all nations. Amen. So if, you, if we would all just affect one person a year and then teach someone else, that would be 500 the first year. Then we go to 1,000 a, a after that year. Then 2,000, then 4,000, then 8,000. I did all my piece of paper. And you know something? We can get to 8 billion people in just 24 years. Does that fire you on up or not, church? You see, we're not in 1999 where disciples are unified and we have one church in one city. We're in year 2004. We're back in 1970. We're back in the early 80s. We got to understand. New wine and old wine skin, it's just going to explode. Now, I think there are churches, when they hear the preached word of God, are going to respond. And people are going to come to it like a magnet. That's happening in Baltimore right now with Doug Arthur. That's happening in Charlotte with a guy like Ron Drabo. But I'm telling you, in many parts of the United States, we got big churches that... Not only are autonomous from all other ones, they have no overseeing evangelists. They have autonomous regions. They're none of them the same. None of them doing the same. All different stages of lukewarmness. And yet they still want to be called model churches. You say, well, that's radical. That changes the whole world order. Well, welcome to our brave new world. You see, our fifth charge is to pray for the gathering. The gathering out of the old ICOC of people that want to be totally sold out disciples. The gathering out of the mainline church of Christ. The gathering out of the Christian churches. We need to pray once more that there will be a gathering of disciples that God will forge into a movement that will literally change the world. You see, number one, 
Ordinary men receive extraordinary upward calls. Take up. Number two, ordinary friends become extraordinary side-by-side partners. Side. And number three, extraordinarily down, disastrous times become extraordinary opportunities for God. Down. What is the charge? Up. Side. Down. That's what we're going to do. Upside down, the world needs changing. Rattle the cage. There's chains that need a breaking. A ragged band of men went out to Jerusalem one day and shouted out in every tongue words he sent them to say. 3,000 souls agreed, and so the work had just begun. And that day at Pentecost was like a starting gun. Only a few weeks earlier, the Lord was crucified. Now on every corner of Jerusalem, the Lord was multiplied. His words scattered the starving souls like seeds scattered on breezes. And now there's not just one to kill. There are 3,000 Jesuses. 2,000 years and here we are. A world of waste and screams. But just a ragged band of men can reawaken all the dreams. There's a way to take this planet and change everything around. Or a better way to say it. Let's just turn the whole thing upside down.